there are four distinct ways of entering or approaching the furniture domain. The gallery artist, yeah, this is where it, we just got it in there. The gallery artist, the bespoke maker, artisan production, and the educated demonstrator. I think most of us really, you know, are doing more than one of those, but for for purposes of simplification, I'm trying to define it a little more clearly. These practices may be in combination, but most likely the maker becomes known within one of these fields. Education is the domain, uh, in the domain may not help establish a clear alternative ways forward. Presenting it to the student, clear, presenting to the student clear options is the better approach that not every instructor can offer. I will talk about each approach specifically. The gallery artist is what I was describing through the cardboard box. This also represents a typical engagement with organizations, galleries, and museums. It is a given the work has to be good technically and aesthetically. Importantly, whatever is made, it has to work for the organization or the end user. As soon as you step out of the studio, workshop, a symbiotic relationship is being entered. Put yourself in the other's shoes. Professional courtesy and being fully engaged is the only acceptable way forward. The field is highly competitive. Go to the openings of the exhibitions. Talk to the gallery directors and museum curators. They are your allies. Their existence depends on artists and makers who are on top of their game. Not necessarily at the top of the domain, just on top of their own activity. If you think of this as a community of people, that you are part of, then also connect with the collectors, journalists, and scholars. What I've described briefly is the gallery artist's activity uh, that surrounds the actual making. Put bluntly, it's not enough to just make good work. Working with galleries and museums, there is often a criteria or set of expectations that have to be fulfilled. Seldom will the organization come to you saying they want to show your work. More likely, at least in the beginning, it is necessary to enter competitions to get your name and work out there. To illustrate, while writing this piece, an email, an email message came through from Craft Ontario. They were requesting submissions for exhibitions. There were criteria that went like this. Yeah, we get them all in there, that's good. Alignment with the uh, Craft Ontario exhibitions, this is their vision, mission, mandate. Demonstrates excellence, whatever that is. Explores a new area of investigation and or is interdisciplinary. Addresses historic context and or tradition through contemporary work. Provides an innovative approach and incites dialogue. Promotes intellectual... Uh, intercultural, I nearly said intellectual understanding, maybe that too, but promotes intercultural understanding. Um, establishing how well something works means it needs a criteria. Assessing the work is always against some expectation. The solution have to be relevant to a context. The viewer will measure how well it works against, for example, demonstrates excellence or promotes intercultural understanding. The gallery artist must be able to respond to others' criteria as well as their own and look for a gallery that has the same values. If the gallery owner does not understand what you're doing, then you have real problems. The artist's statement becomes an essential tool not only for you but also the gallery and ultimately the purchaser. A simple, clear paragraph needs to represent you and your work. If you are not, great, if you're not a great writer, get help. That's what I do. Yeah. Uh, the bespoke maker. This is the last piece um, I made before coming here. Um, it's a wine table. The bespoke maker has some similarities to the gallery artist in that they will show their work in exhibitions occasionally. Usually the bespoke maker will live in a community that's bigger than a village and smaller than a major urban center. The community is not just professionals from the domain, rather people in the neighborhood who need something special to be made. The bespoke maker becomes known for certain things. 
It may include a particular aesthetic, but more likely quality of workmanship, delivery on agreed time, a price that is reasonable and compatible with the trades. Most important for the maker is a reputation for integrity, that is, the process is fully integrated. Supplying a story about the work has huge value. This story can be told at a dinner parties and gets the word of mouth developing. Journalists will also find the story helpful as they prepare to write about you and your work. Most of my work comes from people I know, or friends, or someone with whom I have worked. Clients of the bespoke maker might have a very clear idea on what they want. I find usually they come to me saying, we like your ideas, may we have something like the piece we saw on your website or in an exhibition. They may ask you to copy something they've seen in a magazine. Deciding what you will do or will pass on to the maker down the road is important to get right. Working with a client is a great pleasure usually. Bringing clarity to the design process for the client is essential. Constructing the piece is only part of the process. Constructing a relationship is equally important. The client may not be sure what they want. It may be necessary to suggest their idea won't work and you have, to, and you have a better idea. If you don't like working with others, then being bes a bespoke maker is not a great way forward. If this is not in an enjoyable process, then becoming a manufacturer or working as in artisan production may be a better option. I learned the hard way to get all the information up front and defining the problem. I had a client say when looking at a design, a design proposal, oh, I wanted French provincial design. Needless to say, French provincial was not the relevant to me or what I thought the context demanded. In that case, I suggested someone else who will think I've done them a real favor by person passing the work along to them. Clients range from immediate family, neighbors, people from the city, state or province, or occasionally internationally. The people, I guess I, no, it's okay. No, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not nodding. <laughs> yeah. um, the people you know are most likely to ask for specific problems to be solved. The problem solving starts at home. Take this walking cane as an example. Yep. It was made for my partner. After much deliberation for this talk, I selected the walking cane to talk about. It's so relevant, the selected cane is not on display in an exhibition. It is in play, being used every day. I like that when it's on display, it's out of play. The play or story goes like this. On a cold February morning, Margaret, my partner, was, was going to work. There was a very thin layer of powdery snow on black ice. Margaret slipped and she tried to, as she tried to cross the road, breaking her ankle in, in several places. For a couple of months, she was in a wheelchair and then the cane became an essential object. I made a couple of canes. The first is ergonomically correct and fits her hand perfectly. That's the one shown here, yes. The second cane was a, the production model, uh, quick to make with a generalized handle to fit, the, to fit the average side hand. Margaret prefers the custom turned and carved solution with the comfortable fit to her hand. I think there's an interesting distinction there where the craft part of it, I think, uh, of making something very specific for, for another person is really an important part of the craft activity. Industrial designers just cannot do that, so they always have to generalize it for the average hand. This is the story of an everyday object that is indispensable with extreme relevance and it carries meanings of compassion and caring for the other. In my new book, I tell the story of each object. The object has a subject and a context. I have found it useful to evaluate the work through thinking about self subject, object, and context. Yeah. The manufacturer or artisan production is about making multiples of the same object. Most manufacturers have a range of products and one will sell better than another. There are three fundamental aspects to being in production. 
One, it's important to have a technical bent for efficient means through jigging along with inventory control and a willingness to do it again and again. Two, being familiar with the new technology is essential. The third is the ability to understand market trends and know the retailers who will represent the brand of objects. The additional, in addition, being close to the market will cut down on shipping expenses. I find it challenging to sell one, let alone a batch of 10 or 100. I have had great success with salad servers and cutting boards, but when it comes to furniture, bespoke is a better approach for me. A different temperament produces one-offs compared to production pieces. They both require problem-solving skills that are technical and aesthetic. It's important the human interaction with clients or retail buyers that needs different approaches. With the client, it becomes a discussion of personal needs and wants. The client, you hope, will be interested in your evolving style, and there's a symbiotic relationship through a back and forth. It is a dance, a waltz with some and a tango with others. The retail buyer will talk about trends, price point, and speed of delivery. It's less romantic and more hard-nosed analysis and what's and, and a more hard-nosed analysis of what's hot or what's not. The magazines will be pushing a particular color or look, and you have, and we have just gone through or are going through the exposed Wayne Edge and on tabletops. There are some manufacturers who will lead the trends and the magazines will popularize the product. I find it all rather fickle, but others enjoy the challenge of figuring what's next. The demonstrator educator starts out as a maker and then wants to share the knowledge. There's a full range of educational opportunities, but universities require an MA to teach. The other equally important area is the front door of the studio, where talking with the public is a major opportunity to educate. They are equal opportunities, but the pay scale may be different. It represents the next generation of makers and the next generation of buyers. The buyers need to be educated just as much as the makers. Last time I was in Australia, there were many makers who had sales areas where the public and maker would interact. In North America, we have the studio tours, which are somewhat equivalent, although much more sporadic. I have found there is more time educating the public then, and then there is, there is as much time making the sale. Between these two extremes, there is a maker in my region with a tiny workshop selling turn spice mills. He also teaches classes with no more than three participants in a session. It's highly effective business approach with a small controlled product range sold mainly through craft fairs. The business is a combination of manufacturing in a small garage with occasional educational opportunities through a specific technique and product. It has a well-defined, sharp focus. Of the many teaching variations, the last maker educator I shall mention is the circuit rider or workshops, people of workshops and conferences. With a specific technique, an ability to demonstrate and talk about the process, process it is possible to find colleges and clubs that will inter be interested in the demonstrator educator. Start with regional clubs and build out from there. I can't emphasize enough the value of yeah, thanks. <clears throat> I can't emphasize enough the value of getting good at one thing first. Become known for a particular ability or product. Once people hear, they may come looking for you or your work. Then build out from there the particular to the general. It is a matter of seeing new relationships, connecting the dots, and grasping juxtaposition. It happens all the time in life. Getting good at seeing the relevance in the relationship is fundamental to many any maker's practice. It is being mindful. Working the connection between the need and the outcome is something the pre-conscious can get very good at. Framing the problem really helps a good outcome. Like any journey, knowing where you want to go, it really helps. Getting good at one thing and then, like the tree, branching out from that.
Be radical from your own roots. There is a slight danger of becoming too diverse and a jack of all trades, but equally there is a danger of being too narrow and unable to find a large enough market. These days, with social networking, there is a better chance of success by being narrow in focus while presenting to the larger audience. I'm sure I've got another page here, yes. Yep. What makes one destination or piece of work better than another? Developing criteria and objectives is useful, if not essential. It's also understood as a design brief. Educators will usually establish the guiding criteria for the student. On leaving education, the criteria will become yours if you are working as an artist. If working with a client, the objectives are symbiotic and shared. If manufacturing, the market will push and pull in its unique fashion. Different temperaments will lean towards different approaches. Seldom are we brilliant in all ways. And now as I finish, let, let's think about the future and the idea of gridlock in our lives. I'm a person from, a country, from the country, while most people are living in North America's great urban centers. So the animal analogies may not work so well for you. But I think it's worth the try to see the other's point of view. Today's gridlock and pollution in the major centers is the 19th century equivalent to the problem of horse manure. There is just too much of it. We each have to become part of the solution by not riding the horse to work, so to speak. Climate change is a huge problem we have inherited and it's not going away soon. How relevant is your work in this context? How many more wacky objects does the environment need? Don't forget, the cardboard box is w in which you will pack the relevant objects for others. These ideas are relevant. They count in the larger context and the way forward. Another, anima, another animal analogy I like goes like this. My daughter is a beekeeper and occasionally I help out. Bees are very interesting to work with and, th and things need to be set up right. It's vital for colony survival. Making a context in which the bees will survive is essential or they will fly away. In your practice as a maker, if things are not set up right, the bees and all the honey they represent will fly away. So you can see, horse manure, huge problem. A well-run beehive, lots of honey. Thank you. Um, there are four books I'm going to talk about very, very briefly uh, that I found useful. Some of these books are tangential to what I've talked about, but um, they, they do sort of fit in for um, the talk. Yeah. So this first one, The Conditions of Success, is just a small book, How the Modern Artist Rises to Fame. And um, it's a very depressing book. The, the, the nip-ups you have to go through are, are very kill this. There we go. Yeah, thanks. The nip-ups you have to go through to survive in the art world are, in the fine art world, are, are extreme. And um, I certainly made a number of false moves, which immediately ruled me out. So I think that uh, if, you really, if you really want to go the fine art route, you do need to read something like this and, and talk to people in the field about the procedure and the process you need to go through. Fortunately, within the crafts, we don't have to be bothered with it. Um, but we do need to pay attention to it. And uh, it's just not so extreme for us. Um, any questions on that? What, were the, what, what did I fail at? Finding a, a good, really good gallery that would represent me, and I would keep getting new work in there and, and, and keep putting on exhibitions. Um, you know, I did it for a while and then I sort of just petered out on it. Commission work came along, commission, uh, you know, fairly large public commissions and so on, and so I just stopped doing it. But I think it really is essential to keep your private 
commercial gallery uh, very active with your work. Um, but if you get lots of large commissions, how do you have time then to supply the gallery? If you've had big commissions. Well, well, I would do it in between. Right. Yeah. So, so and, and, and the exhibitions, you know, would be certainly, uh, they say every two years or, you get, or, you're, or you're forgotten. So, uh, yeah. Any, anything else? All right, let's go on to the bespoke maker then. The next slide. This is um, a book that uh, Ned Cook um, rec recommended to me. His, Ned Cook is the historian, furniture historian, and uh, we've, we've had, over the years, we've had many kinds of conversations and he thought I might be interested in this one by Douglas Harper, Working Knowledge. Um, it really is about a contemporary blacksmith, so a guy who fixes cars and signs and, and uh, will do any kind of odd job. But it, it, it positions him within the community of how he works within the community. Um, and uh, I found it pretty useful because it's, it's not so ego-driven um, it really is just about the, you know, the guy down the road. And maybe that's what I am as well, you know. When I'm making stuff, uh, you can forget the pretensions. I'm just the woodworker down the road. And that can be a much healthier attitude, I think, than, than playing the big art role. So um, I think it's thinking, that's really is thinking through the realities of, of one's own community and how you survive in it. Um, Mm -hmm. Next. Uh, so the artisan production or awesome manufacturing. Um, Tony Fry's book is, um, uh, this, this one is a bit oblique. I think there may be better books, but I couldn't think of a better book when I was doing this. Uh, and uh, he, I think he's looking to the future and when I look at manufacturing, I think, my God, you know, do we need all this stuff? You know, and I look in my own home and, and, and wonder, you know, do I need all this stuff? Uh, and so I think if you get into manufacturing and you're making many, it's really important these days to think about the, the environment and the future and, and what it is you're doing. It's a, this kind of proliferation of consumer things. Uh, I think we, we need to pull back from that and really work that one through. And I think he has a, he has a very good stance on this, um, sustainability ethics and new practice. Um, and while it may not be seem immediately important to you, I think, because he's talking a lot about architecture and industrial design, I think as, a, as an artisan maker, we do it producing more than one, I think it, it does become relevant. Cradle to Cradle is a very good book also. Cradle to Cradle. Oh, yeah, right. Yeah, I've heard of it, not read it. Yeah. Can, can you tell me anything more about it? It's essentially the same thing. Uh -huh. it's, it's about sustainability. It's about our attitudes towards manufacturing, you know, how we manufacture things, um, why we do it, and what happens to those objects, you know, and, and uh, the reuse, the concepts of reuse, the depth. So your 
There's going to be another picture of a book. Oh, okay, yeah, the first, that, that's right, that one there, thanks. Um, yeah, pretty, pretty early on, uh, it, when I got into, well, arriving in Canada and then setting up my own studio uh, a few years after arriving, um, I met a Bob Wheely, who's who's the author of this book and this whole program, he, he was running a leadership program and I was involved in it teaching a design course and we've remained friends ever since. So I'm a little biased towards uh, him and his work, but um, it, it's sort of on the edge of self-help, um, but it's also, I think, very useful to get hold of material that helps you to focus, that, that trains the mind to think in certain patterns. I, fe I found for a very long time that I would get the order wrong in terms of the way I was thinking about designing and making stuff. And, you know, in the craft, certainly procedure is absolutely fundamental. You've got to do it in the right order, otherwise things will really mess up. And I think the same is true with the creative process, that getting it into the right order uh, can help you with the problem solving. I'm not talking about those intuitive leaps of, of really making connections spontaneously. I'm really talking about when you've got a problem, how do you solve it? What, is the, what are the steps that you go through? So I found his um, observations pretty useful. You know, it's also, I, I do it, it's in my book as well, this one. There's one chapter that talks about that sort of process. Um, any, anybody got any observations on that sort of area? Any other books that you've read that you might find useful to share? No. Yeah, for years I relied on that one. So. Yeah, so, you know, if you've not read any of this, that, that would be a really good one to get into. It, probably a little bit easier reading. Uh, I think yeah. The Universal Traveler, Traveler, Bagnall and Coburg were the authors. I mean, you take it in the most you can. It's not a book you could read for a little point of that. No. Just you open it up and you read a paragraph and then... Go, and then go to sleep. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, okay. Um, anything else? Well, I'm curious. In this particular time, I'm noticing like, all the conversations I've had at this conference, everybody's struggling. So in spite of whatever strategies you decide to embrace or whatever professional um, approach you take in terms of, you know, kind of gallery or production, how do you respond to an overall malaise in the economic environment? Uh, of the, of this community, yeah. yeah. Well, um, that's really difficult because I think we're all in different levels, different ages, different. Everything's so different that it's very difficult to come out with one sort of. I was going to say pronouncement to to sort of sum it up. Um, but you know, the, I started thinking about relevance because because I could see that things were, were less relevant than they maybe should be. And uh, um, how, do you, how do you get your focus and make the connections it, is really what I've been trying to talk about here. Uh, I think in the last session, <clears throat> it was all about passion. You know, if you've got the passion, you'll make it until you burn out. And, and there was sort of references to that as well. Uh, and surely we can be creative without 
having to pour so much into it, your relationships break up and, and uh, you know, you, you have a nervous breakdown and, and, and they, they did make reference to somebody who, who had a nervous breakdown. And I've seen that too. I had a very good friend in college who, very brilliant guy, and um, he uh, became so perfectionist in his attitude that he kind of stopped himself from doing anything because it was never quite good enough. And, uh, you, you know, I, I saw that happen and there was nothing I could do for him and he couldn't pull himself out of it and, and basically he quit. So finding balance in your life, I think, is really critical. Um, and the, it, um, the speaker on the left helped me on that. I've forgotten his name. Brian. Brian, yeah, sorry, thanks. Um, Brian talked a bit about that, I think, finding that balance where um, financially you have enough that you can go ahead and be creative. If you're, having, if you're anxious about your finances and, and other stuff, then you just can't do it, or it becomes more difficult. And so uh, how do you find that balance? I mean, some people find it by getting another job, and it's maybe part-time work and then they can do their own work and there's no pressure on them to, to perform. They can find their own way through that way. Um, but I've, I've felt that um, I should be able to earn my living at it and so I've been a bit bloody-minded about it. Uh, the thing I may have not got quite right, I think, is doing, trying to do everything. So I've tried the galleries, I've tried bespoke making, I've tried manufacturing, you know, I've, I've tried education, and you become, tend to become a jack of all trades and not so good in sort of one or two areas. Uh, that, that maybe is my lot, you know, that I've ended up being a writer as, as, as well. Um, I'm a lousy public speaker, but, you know, I'm, I'm sort of not too bad on the writing end. Um, so, um, you know, I think we each end up finding our own way through, uh, and figuring out who you are is is really f pretty fundamental to this process. And one of the things with uh, this book is that there are ways of finding out the kind of personality that you have, and probably you can see a, a way forward more clearly, because we may aspire to something, but it's just not within our skill level. I mean, I'll never be a scientist. I may like to be one, but I'll never be one, you know, because I don't have that temperament, that uh, intellectual ability in that way. Uh, my intellectual ability is somewhere else, and figuring that out is really important as to where does your ability lie? Where are your roots, and how do you build on your roots? So the tree analogy, I think, is really a good one. So, you know, you branch out, and you go other places, and and you fill out in sort of the three dimensions, and it's a good way of thinking about it. Does that answer it? Yeah, sort of. I think in some ways it's a flawed concept economically. You know, I think probably in the last, probably about having passion, people are all here because we want to do it. And when I started it, I don't know how many people said, you can never make a living at it. And I said, I don't care. This is what I'm doing. And, uh, and the, I think the idea of me coming up to something and then going to the world and saying, hey, what do you think? Is so, because 99.9% of the world doesn't even know that I exist. Mm -hmm. um, whereas IKEA, you know, I'm just saying, anybody needs a table for 65 bucks and we're going to give it to them. Yeah. Um, which is the economic, the, the right way. Mm -hmm. So I, you know, so then I think it's the passion. I mean, it's, that's the only thing that got me through. And, and uh, you know, I'm, you know, I'm sort of scared to say that I'm an instructor. I get paid every day for something. You know, I, <laughs> <laughs> I used to, uh, you know, I did my, I did some. I didn't do. That, that's I didn't, you know, I didn't stick in it as long as you guys did. Um, so I can't speak to that. Yeah. I haven't been there in a while. Yeah. yeah to me, that, the book uh, Working Knowledge by Douglas Harper, yeah. 
he's fully integrated into his community. He's essential to the community and uh, he's relevant to his community, you know, and all that kind of stuff. And that's, I think, how you need to develop yourself within your community is to be relevant and connected. And, uh, you, know, go, I mean, you know, it's really important, I think, for me, with the range of things that I'm involved in, to be at the gallery, the public gallery, go to the openings and talk with the, all the people there that I can. And, um, you know, within the, that sort of community, I'm fairly well known, and, and they come to me on for stuff. And, uh, you know, uh, that's not going to be for everybody, for sure. I think that's a good note to end on. So, thank you. Thank you.